All right, guys. So I know that looking at the homework assignments for this week that at first glance they may seem a little daunting, but they're actually quite simple. And these are things that you're going to have to learn how to do as network professionals and stuff that you're going to be doing on a day-to-day basis. So it's really important that you actually learn how to do them. So let's, I'm going to be demoing a couple of these different things. And uh, I think you'll see after I demo a few of them how easy this really is. So we're going to be doing this in a Windows 7 environment, uh, which is also very similar to Windows Vista. So if you have a Vista or a Windows 7 computer, uh, you'll be seeing how to do that here. And on the right, we have a virtualized uh, Windows XP environment. So if you're running XP, I'll demo how to do so a couple things in there as well. So the first thing is, yes, you have to get used to the command line because you're going to be using the command line for the rest of your career. So to open a command line in Windows 7, you simply open the start menu and you can type either command or a shortcut is CMD, uh, which is, opens a DOS prompt. And that's how we do it there. In XP, it's, a little, it's, al it's almost exactly the same, except the run button's in a different place. So you'll click Run, also CMD, and click OK, and that gives you a DOS prompt in XP. So the first thing that the assignments are going to ask you to do is get very comfortable with ipconfig. And ipconfig is an excellent tool. Uh, you'll be using that quite a bit in, as a network professional. So ipconfig is just going to give you a basic breakdown of what is going on with your computer's IP address information. So I type in ipconfig, I click Enter, and I automatically see what my local IP address is. It's 192.168.1.10. I also see my subnet mask, extremely important as you learned in chapter four, and my default gateway, which at my home residence is going to be my router address. Uh, we can go over here and type in ipconfig. And the same information, we can see that the XP environment has a different IP address, uh, 1.8 instead of our 1.10 over here. Same subnet mask and as the same default gateway since they're both connected to the same router. Understand that at enterprise level environment, the gateway and the router may be different, but you typically in a home setting, uh, your router and your gateway will be one and the same. So now we have good IP information for both of these different computers. So this is something that you should be very comfortable just sitting down. The first thing you do, IP config, and you have a wealth of information at your fingertips about what's going on with the network connectivity. Uh, you will also see in your book that um, ipconfig slash all. Sometimes you will have multiple network adapters on your computer that you're working on. You may have a wireless adapter and a hardline adapter. And when you do ipconfig that's all, it gives you a little bit extra information. So these are all the different um, all the different adapters that are on my computer right now. So I get a lot more information just with the standard ipconfig. So the all gives you just that little bit of extra edge. So it, I'll demo it again over here, ipconfig forward slash all, and we can see that gives me a little bit more information than we did with the uh, the standard IP config. So if you need that little bit extra info, um, that's always good. I get in the habit of just doing IP config slash all as a default because the IP config just gives me a little bit less information and I want to have the most information that I can possibly have. All right, so we'll also be talking about the different switches that we can use with the IP config command because with DOS commands we can add switches and one of the, or if you're curious to know what switches you can add to the IP config, you can always do slash question mark, which will show you all the different commands that you are capable uh, with IP config, all renew and release. So the book will ask you to release your IP, and we can demo that here. So we'll type in IP config slash release. We'll make this a little bigger so you can see. And you can go ahead and click enter. And what happens is we immediately get, get an IP address of 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0. That basically means at this point we don't have an IP address. We released it. We let it go. So that 192.168.1.8 that we had right here has been let go, and we are now uh, have nothing. We have a 0.0.0.0, .0 address. So we can go ahead and renew this, and this is going to send a call out to the DHCP server which is going to reassign us a new IP. So we'll go ahead and ipconfig slash renew. And we'll give that just a second as it communicates with the IP. And the, the DHCP server saw fit to go ahead and hand us back the same address, which is 192.168.1.8. If some other people had gotten in line before us with the DHCP server, they might have gotten 8. And if we had come in later, we may have gotten 10 or 11 or 12. But since no one else is on the network right now, it went ahead and assigned me back that same address. So that is how release and renew and IP config function. Very useful information.
The other command that you're going to be uh, doing inside of this is going to be the ping command. Now, we already demonstrated on the Windows side that my IP address here is 192.168.1.10. So that's my IP address, IPv4 address over here on the Windows side. And we know here from ipconfig that the XP side has 192.168.1.8. The ping command is a great tool because it allows you to establish connectivity between two different boxes. It's basically like saying hello from your computer to another computer and making sure that there's good connection. This is useful because you may not always know if a computer is online and you need to establish if it has connectivity. So you may have a client uh, who is miles away from you. You may have a server that's in a different part of your building and you don't actually want to walk down there. So you can just ping it. So I'm going to use the Windows 7 computer and I will ping the XP computer. I need to know it's either its name or its IP address. All right, so I know the address over here is 192.168.1.8. So I will ping it to see if I get a response from that computer. So I'll ping 192.168.1.8. And notice that I get four replies from this computer, which means that this computer is talking to this computer and has good connectivity on the network. So we just established that. We also get some good information. Uh, the time to live is 128 seconds. That's how long those pings will bounce around the network. Uh, we also see the time that it took for us to communicate, in this case, less than one millisecond. So we have very good traffic balance on this network. So a command that I like to do a lot is continuous ping. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll restart a machine, and I'll be waiting for it to come back up. And I don't want to keep typing the ping command over and over again to see when it does come back up. So I'll ping, and this is a dash T switch which continues the ping uh, indefinitely. So I'll ping dash T 192.168.1.8 and I will get an infinite number of replies. And I'll give you an example of why this is very useful. So let's say we decide to reboot this Windows XP machine. So I've initiated a reboot on the client's computer and I'm at my desk, I can't actually see what's going on. So it's gonna restart. And when it does restart, watch on my left here that at some point, we're going to start getting some non-replies, request timed out. So I now know from my desk using the ping command that the Windows XP machine, the client machine, or the server is now restarting. Now, how do I know when it comes back up? Well, eventually, this will reestablish connection on this side, and I'll start getting some good pings back on this side to see when that happens. And when it does occur, I'll know that my computer has been reestablished. So see how useful this ping command can be uh, in determining if a computer away from you has good connectivity. Now to stop a, a continuous ping with the dash T switch, uh, you have to push control C. And that control C will stop um, that ping command. So that is ping in essence. If you have internet connectivity, you can ping some other things. But understand that not all websites allow the ping command. It's kind of a security risk in a way, so not all of them will respond. So here, because I can ping Google, um, this means that I have good internet connectivity, so I can go outside of my network. I can also try to ping yahoo.com. And this is always a really excellent way to see that if your client or if your server or whatever you're working on actually has good internet connectivity. So we'll ping here and you see I have a syntax command error. I did not type in the ping command. I just typed in www.google.com. So I will ping www.google.com. And we see now that the XP machine is also verified because it gets good replies, is on the internet and good to go. Now you're probably accustomed to just opening up uh, Internet Explorer or Firefox or something and seeing, well, do I get this Google homepage? Well, that's kind of an amateur way of testing to see if you have internet connectivity. This gives you really good solid information to show that yes, I can indeed get outside the network. The other thing that your homework assignments are gonna be asking you to do is modify TCP IP settings. So we'll close a couple of these uh, DOS windows since we won't be using those now. All right. Now, 
This is where it gets a little different between XP and Windows 7. It's a very similar concept, uh, just little buttons are a little bit different place. So this is what we'll do. Now in Windows 7, you will typically have something down here in your bottom right next to your clock that will have either a wireless adapter or a hardline LAN connection. And you can right click that, right click it, and open Network and Sharing Center, which gives you something like this. The other way to do that is if you have the network icon on your desktop, you can right click that and go to properties. Notice that it opens exactly the same window. So two ways to do the exact same thing. Your preference. I prefer to come down here every time because this is usually right here. And just right click and open network and sharing center. So we'll leave that open for just a second. Now, on the XP side, you're probably going to have something like this where there's nothing in the bottom right hand corner. So this can be adjusted. So this is what you'll probably have to do. So first of all, because you're a power user and you're actually an IT professional, you need to get some power icons on your desktop. So we're going to modify, and I'll do that again. We right click and go to properties on your desktop. You're going to click on desktop, and we're going to customize that desktop. And we're going to put all of these on here. We want my documents, my computer, my network places, and so on and so forth. And we're going to apply that and click OK. And now we get those four icons. So we can right click on my network places and go to properties. And we get this screen here, which notice is a lot different than the screen is here. So this is what we're really after is our local area connection. Or if you're using wireless, you may see a wireless connection here. Either way is fine, depending on what you have connected at home. Now notice that I don't have that here in Windows 7. I have to go one more step. So to get to this screen that we have over on the XP side, I have to click this change adapter settings that's on the left here. So I'll click that now. And notice that I have a local area connection here and a local area connection over here now. So this is where we want to be. So I'm going to go ahead and click properties. And for you XP users, I want you to go ahead and click the show icon and notification area when connected and click OK. And what that's going to do is populate that nice little thing down here in the bottom right hand corner, which we have in Windows 7 as well. So you'll be able to right click that from now on and open network connections and get right here really easily without having to deal with the My Network Places. So your book is going to request that you change a little bit about the TCP IP settings. No problem. So we're going to right click on local area connection and we're going to adjust its properties. So the properties of your network card. And what you see here, both in XP and in Windows 7, is all of the protocols or the languages that your network card is capable of speaking. And we are primarily concerned in Chapter 4 with the TCP IP protocol. And we're going to be adjusting that. So we're going to click on TCP IP. And this works the same way both in, in XP and 7. And we're going to click Properties. So we'll come over here and click Properties. Now notice that both of these machines are set to obtain an IP address automatically. And you know after reading Chapter 4, this is called DHCP, uh, Dynamic Host Control Protocol, which means that both these computers are automatically getting an IP address uh, from the DHCP server. Now your book is going to request that you change that so that it is statically assigned. Now again, going back to Command and pulling an IP config, we see that my address is 192.168.1.10. Now, looking in your book, if you flip forward, you're going to have a couple pages that address classes. And you're going to have to do some calculations in your homework assignment to figure out what your static IP address needs to be. So you can look on page 151 and page 148 to determine, based on what you have dynamically assigned, what you need to assign uh, for your static. So I know that a 192.168.1.10 address is class C, which is going to have a 255.255.255.0 subnet mask. So we're going to click Properties. And we're basically going to be switching from a dynamic address to a static one. So we're going to click Use the following IP address. Now the book is going to ask you to calculate out, based on uh, pages 148 to 151, to figure out the range of your IP address and what can communicate with what. So over on this side, on the XP side, again, I have pulling IP config. 
a 192.168.1.8 address. So when I statically assign something here, I need to make sure that the address I put here can communicate with this address here. Now I know this is a class C address based on chapter uh, pages 148 and 151. And I know it has a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. And what that essentially means is that 192, that 168, and that one are locked in because that 255, 255, 255 locks that in. We'll be talking a little bit about how that works later. So those first three numbers are not changeable because of that subnet mask. So I only have the last zero octet to work with. So I have to make my number something here, so I'll make it 50. And notice that when I click tab, that it automatically assigns the subnet mask for me. It recognizes this as a class C address and automatically populates 255, 255, 2550. Again, I had to keep the 192.168.1 the same because that 255, 255, 255 locks those three numbers in place. This zero gives me all of this last octet to work with. So I can put anything I want here as long as it doesn't conflict with what's over here. Now, I know my default gateway based on the IP config that I pulled in Windows 7 and in XP is 192.168. 1.250. So I will type that in here in my default gateway. And I will click OK. I will leave the DNS blank for now. So I click OK. And it's very important that you close this window because the change does not actually take place until that occurs. All right, so to verify that my changes have actually occurred, I'm going to open up another command window and IP config again. And notice that my IP address is now 192.168.1.50. Now, how do I know that this is within the range of this one based on class? Well, I can ping it and determine if they can actually communicate or not. So again, we're going to be using that ping command, 192.168. And remember, I'm going to ping this one over here. So I'm going to ping the 1.8 address. And I do get a successful reply. So to switch back to dynamic, I'll close this. Again, we'll do this from scratch. I'm going to come down here, open Network and Sharing Center. I got to click that Change Adapter Settings. We will right click on that, go to Properties. We are looking for the TCP IP Protocol Properties. And I'll go ahead and change that back to Obtain an IP Address Automatically. Also Obtain DNS Automatically. Click OK. Very important that you close this window, otherwise nothing happens. And to verify that my changes have gone back to normal, I'll pull a command again, IP config, and notice that I have been dynamically assigned the 192.168.1.10 address. The last thing I want to cover is um, related to the ping command. You won't always have another computer to work with, so maybe a computer is independent or you just want to test to make sure that the network card and that computer is working correctly, and the best way to do that is to ping yourself. And there's a special command to do this, and that is 127.0.0.1. This is a special IP address, which is always you. Whatever computer you're at, if you ping that address, you are pinging yourself. So you know when you ping 127.0.0.1 that if you get a good reply, you know that your network card is functioning, TCP IP is properly installed, and you should be able to establish a good connection as long as your switches and routers are functioning properly. So that's a very important command to know. If you can't ping 127.0.0.1, then there's something fundamentally wrong with your computer. You may have heard the saying, there's no place like home. In IT, we say there's no place like 127.0.0.1. I hope that this uh, demonstration has helped you a little bit with the homework, and you got to see kind of how easy and quick it is to initiate some of these commands. I hope you practice them over the next week and get very comfortable with them. They will serve you well in the years to come.